Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our ESG and Sustainability Webinar Series for 2023. Um, as always, I have with me Ashley Bleeker uh, from our sustainability team here in Melbourne. So hello, Ashley. Morning, Letta. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, the tennis is now over, so I have to start working for 2023. Um, my key That's thing is Australian Open. I love the tennis, but now it's back to work, Ashley. <laughs> okay, that means more pressure for me if you're back to work. <laughs> um, we would like to wish all of you uh, a happy new year. We hope 2023 is a great year for you. Um, so when we uh, look at our series of webinars, as you know, we had a whole series of webinars in 2022, where we talked mainly about the ESG sustainability journey, how to get started, how to work towards a sustainability report. We talked about stakeholder engagement. Um, and towards the end of the year, we talked about ESG linked remuneration. We talked about ESG due diligence. We talked about decarbonisation. So uh, a good introduction uh, to all things sustainability. Now we pick it up there. And this year, we start with a sustainability spotlight on uh, the United Nations Sustainability Development, um, Sustainable Development Goals, and the World Economic Forum uh, Framework, the International Business Council, Business Council Framework. So as you know, it's Ashley and I, as it usually is. Um, and then we would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people uh, that are attending our webinar today. So if you look at our webinar series for 2023, we're just kicking it off with six initial sessions up to June, uh, and then we'll schedule the next six. Uh, things are changing so quickly in the world of sustainability that we didn't want to set an agenda for the whole year. Um, so today it's um, United Nations um, Goals and World Economic Forum. And just in another two weeks time on the 15th of February, we are looking at addressing your carbon footprint. Now, this is something that we are seeing a lot at the moment. Clients are saying, Aleta, we need to come up with our baseline initial carbon footprint. Can you help us with that? And of course the answer is yes, we can help you with that. Uh, we've already, or we've just also done that for BDO Australia. Um, so we've done it for our own business and we help, help clients to do that. Um, on the 14th of March, we look at the TCFD disclosures and the ISSB developments, the International Sustainability Standard Board, what they're doing. On the 12th of April, again, something that a lot of clients have approached us about, and that is how do we get the board on board? So how do we put together a business case for sustainability? Uh, then on the 17th of May, we look at the GRI standards that are quite widely used in Australia, very comprehensive. So we want to touch on that as well. <laughs> and then on the 14th of June, uh, we now we will be then approaching 30 June year end for 30 June 23. And we want to talk about how you can get ready with your sustainability report. If you want to register for our webinars, you can go to the link um, at the bottom of the slide. Ashley, anything to add on our upcoming webinars? I know the two of us are super excited. We've already planned a lot of this, so anything to add? Well, I was just going to add that I was super excited, but I don't need to now. <laughs> uh, I've taken the words out of your mouth. Um, and then I, I thought I would also flag that for many years now, I think this is our seventh year, we're running monthly IFRS and corporate reporting webinars. And these are the, uh, the 12 topics for the year. Um, but what you can see is tomorrow we look at what's hot and what's not in IFRS and corporate reporting. And by the way, what's hot is sustainability reporting. So I'll give you a sneak peek in that. And then in a few weeks time on the 22nd of February, uh, we look at how to incorporate sustainability and ESG in your financial report. So again, this is sustainability related topics. And then in March, we look at IFRS S1, which is the very first standard issued by 
the International Sustainability Standards Board. And in April, we look at S2 around climate-related disclosures, similar to the TCFDs. And then in May, we look at financial and sustainability reporting, uh, getting ready for 30 June reporting. Um, in June, we look at the TCFD disclosures, which currently are recommended by most regulators. So again, you can see, even when we look at IFRS, IFRS and corporate reporting webinars, there's a heavy sustainability focus because that is what's hot um, in IFRS as well. Again, you can register for those on our website. Um, there's a bit of overlap between the two series, um, but please pick and choose the ones that you're very interested in or get other people in your organization to register for those. Now, I thought I'll start today to do a little bit of a roundup um, of all the latest developments across the globe around sustainability. Because um, I finished up work um, very early last year, I finished up on the 9th of December, then went on a big family holiday um, on the 10th of December. And while I was away, uh, everything just happened. I read everywhere about sustainability. So a lot of things happened in December and in January, and we thought we'll give you a bit of an update before we head into the United Nations goals. And, and now, you, media you, has, you also said that you therefore should go away more often on holidays because all the exciting sustainability things happen while you're on holiday. Yes, and you were super excited to deal with all those things that I was kind of thinking, well, how am I on holiday? Why am I on holiday? I want to be here. <laughs> Um, so BDO has um, published a document around a, a year-end sustainability reporting update, and there's a link to that document in the picture. Uh, you can read, um, if you want more detail, you can read there, of course. Um, and the reason I want to go back to Europe and I want to go to the United States and what's happening there is we're starting to see similar progress in Australia. So it's giving us a trend and it's actually giving us an idea of what we can expect over the next six to 18 months in Australia. So if you look at the European Union developments, um, so the European Parliament has published the final text for the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive um, and the U EU members now have 18 months to incorporate that directive into their national law. Um, and then the, corp the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which will be embedded in national law, replaces existing non-financial reporting uh, directive. Now, what's really interesting is actually on the right-hand side, and that is which companies are actually required to report under this directive in Europe. So they've decided to start with listed companies except listed micro entities. So it's the top end of the listed entities and all large companies. And they said, how do we define large for corporate reporting or sustainability reporting? If you've got more than 250, um, two out of the following, more than 250 employees, more than 30 million euro turnover, more than 20 million euro total assets. Two of those, you have to do this reporting. Um, it includes subsidiaries of non-EU groups. So again, we could be caught in that. Um, they apply to insurance companies, financial institutions, etc. So there's a lot of detail in the publication on exactly who this applies to. But what you can see is they are phasing it in, starting at the big end of town, and then it drips feed um, through all the companies in the EU. When would it apply? Another interesting question. Um, so they're talking or they've decided it should be year ending 31 December 2024 um, for entities currently um, within the scope of that non-financial reporting directive. So no surprise, um, your listed entities, financial institutions. For other large entities, it's a year later. And then they said for 31 December 2027, if they listed SMEs, small and non-complex credit unions, et cetera. And then 31 December, 2028, basically the rest. So again, it's phasing in the timing, starting at the top end of town. 
and by 2028, the lightest date. And then mandatory assurance. Now, this is interesting. We've talked about assurance a bit, and I think our sixth webinar last year was assurance over sustainability information. Uh, so they've decided initially limited assurance, similar to what we see in Australia, but then it will be expanded in future to reasonable assurance. So that's normal audit, reasonable assurance. So limited assurance review initially, going towards full audit, um, which is reasonable assurance. So that's what we see in the EU. Uh, in the EU. The EU. Um, the other thing that they've done is the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG, um, delivered the first batch of European sustainability reporting standards. So they've not waited for the ISSB to issue more standards. Remember, the ISSB have only issued two exposure drafts on IFRS 1 and S2 to date. Um, so they said, no, we're going to go ahead with 12 standards um, for European entities. Um, so there's the normal ESRS1, the general one, similar to ISSB1. There's the um, there's, um, ESRSE1 around climate change, similar to the TCFD disclosures. But then they also have a specific one on pollution, water and marine resources, biodiversity, ecosystems, um, resource use and circular economy um, and then they've got other standards around social um, so your your own workforce um, workers in the value chain affected communities um, consumers and end users and finally a governance standard around business conduct so this is what we could expect to see at the ISSB as well. So we're looking at this, not because it already applies in Australia, but this is a trend um, and, and what we could expect to see very, very soon. Um, in the United States, that's the other country that's making um, fast pro uh, progress, um, the United States Securities Exchange Commission, so the SEC, um, issued proposed rules that would um, be applicable to domestic and foreign registrants. So again, they're focusing on registrants. Um, and then they said, we want to, re we require significantly enhanced climate related disclosures. Um, interesting is the third bullet point. The proposed financial statement disclosures would be presented in a footnote to consolidated financial statements. So if it's financial statement disclosures, and if it goes into your consolidated financials, it means it's subject to audit, right? And then the last one, um, they said other disclosures would be presented separately in the financial report, but not as part of the audited financial statements. The other part of the financial report, um, they call it management discussion and analysis and MDNA. In Australia, we would call it an OFR, Operating Financial Review, and that's currently where ASIC is recommending we put these disclosures. So again, we are somewhat aligned to, to the US already, but there's certain part of this information that they want in audited financial statements. And then on the right-hand side, there are some quantitative, quantitative disclosures that go in the financial statements, important, audited. All right, so financial impact metrics, expenditure metrics, um, financial estimates and assumptions. And we would expect to see that in our audited financial soon or two. Uh, and then quantitative disclosures that are outside the financial statements in the US are scope one and two and three emissions. So it's somewhere there, scope one, two and three, carbon footprint, which we're talking about next month, but it's in your financial report and then a number of other qualitative disclosures in your financial report, in our OFR or in their MDNA. Again, it gives us good information about trends. The other interesting thing is, again, to which entities does it apply and when does it apply? So this is a little bit of a timeline for the US. Um, so 2023, and that's where we are, all proposed disclosures, um, would have to be in for the large accelerated filers, top listed entities, 
um, but only scope one and two for 2023. 2024, uh, for them, it's also scope three. Um, and limited assurance. So you can see 2023, no assurance. Um, in 2024, scope one, two, and three, limited assurance and reasonable assurance over that. So full audit in 2026. Um, if you are not one of the accelerated filers, um, so I would say somewhat smaller um, filers, um, we've got a delay timeline, a year delay, and for small reporting companies, again, another year delay. Uh, but by 2025, this is in um, for most entities in the US. Um, the other thing that I thought we should look at is the International Sustainability Standards Board and, and where they're up to. So we know last year they've issued the two standards, IFRS S1, or sorry, two exposure drafts, IFRS S1 and IFRS S2. Um, they received more than 1,400 comment letters on these standards. Now that even beats the number of comment letters that they received on lease accounting, which was the highest ranking number of comment letters they've ever received because it was so controversial in uh, 2016. And I think that was around 700 comment letters. So 1,400 comment letters. Um, at the December meeting, they were still discussing those comment letters. They were looking at definition of materiality, uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions and measurement methods, etc. Uh, and the latest prediction is that they'll issue the final, st final standards before June this year. Uh, so that's where they're up to. And I thought at that stage, maybe we should sit back and, and, and look at what Ashley and I have been talking about last year. And that is, in Australia, at the moment, none of this reporting is mandated, but we are seeing a lot of reporting. And why is that? Because in Australia, we are seeing the business opportunity. Initially, we talked about a problem, Ashley, but now it's a business opportunity is this is about access. Forget about mandated requirements. If you want to get access to capital, debt or equity, and access to market your customers or access to people, you need to action sustainability. And if you've actioned sustainability, you have to report that to your stakeholders. So in Australia, whatever we've seen to date was driven by market forces, I would say, access to capital markets and people. So it's quite amazing what we've already seen. The other thing that we've seen towards the end of the year is our regulators are now joining the party and they and ASIC is saying in our OFR, we would write to recommend TCFD disclosures. Um, and then ASX have said in their corporate governance principles, the fourth editions and recommendations, we want to recommend TCFD disclosures. APRA has done the same. Uh, we know the ISSB incorporated those TCFD disclosures in uh, their EDI for S2. Um, and the ASSB in their exposure draft ED321 said, we currently recommend TCFD because it's there, it's issued. But as soon as the ISSB finalise I for S1 and S2, we expect all of these regulators to now not only recommend TCFD, but instead recommend and the um, IFRS S1 and S2, and they've already alluded to that in the publications. So it's market forces driving this. Regulators are trying to encourage, um, but another thing has happened. Um, the tr Treasury have issued an exposure draft in November last year with a very short comment period, where they said, we want to amend the ASIC Act and allow the ASSB um, to not only issue accounting standards, but also issue sustainability reporting standards. Because before this, um, the ASSB didn't have the mandate to issue sustainability reporting standards. So that came quickly. There's an article that we've written with our comments, um, and that's already gone in. Um, I think as an interim measure, I expect the ASSB to be issuing um, accounting standards and sustainability reporting standards. Um, they've added three new board members to the AASB, uh, three board members that have sustainability experience and knowledge. 
Um, longer term, that might not be, on my view, not the best approach. I think we need a separate sustainability reporting uh, board. Um, and that is again included in the latest proposals that we've seen in Australia. Um, so the Australian government or Treasury have in December issued a publication, Climate Related Financial Disclosure, a consultation paper. Um, and in there, they are saying we're going to start with climate related financial risks. Um, and we are going to say these are the disclosures we would like to see around climate related risks. They're asking feedback. The, fee the due date is the 23rd of February and BDO is working on a submission. Um, and the kinds of question is, um, looking at what's happened in the US, the UK, Europe, et cetera, uh, what do you think the initial timing of reporting should be in Australia? Um, you know, are we talking 23, 24, 25? Um, is it 30 June 24? Is it 30 June 25? It won't be later than that. Um, they are thinking of phased implementation, so potentially starting with large listed entities, <coughs> then go to all listed entities, then, you know, financial institutions, insurance, large privates, etc. So they're asking feedback. How should we phase this mandatory reporting um, across entities? And what are the timelines? Um, they also said they would like to align with international disclosures. So they're looking at what the ISSB is doing. Um, <clears throat> they um, are talking about where do you think this disclosure should appear? Should it be in financial statements, um, which will have to be audited from day one? Should it be in the broader financial report, the OFR? Um, or should it be a separate sustainability report? And we see three of all three options in Australia. BDO ourselves, we've got a separate sustainability report that we've issued. Uh, some have it in their OFR with their, with their financial report. Um, very few, but some have something in their financial statements. Um, they're talking about the linkage between what's in your financial statements and what's in your sustainability report. Um, they're talking about the data required to prepare this reporting and are we ready and are organisations ready to capture this data that will have an impact on timing. And then finally, there's a big discussion around assurance. Um, you know, if financial statements are required to be audited, uh, surely sustainability information, and at this stage they start with climate, but it will expand to the other aspects, Surely we need some form of assurance. And I'm thinking currently they're saying, is it limited assurance that then become audit? And again, what's the timeline? So this is all happening in Australia. And if you just look at this, you might say, where does it come from? It is following the trends we see globally. Um, and therefore, you know, BDO and our team are working on putting in a, a response, um, but it's out there for for comment to our clients as well, but it gives us a really good idea of what we can expect in the next six to 18 months. It's moving at a rapid pace. Um, Ashley, over to you to talk about the other big development in Australia around the safeguard mechanism um, and the Climate Bill Act. Oh, well, you were on such a roll, a letter off. I thought you might keep going, but I'm happy to do this if you like me to. Um, it's not. <laughs> nowhere near as sexy as a consultation paper or an exposure draft or uh, any of those other things. But um, many of you would be aware that the uh, federal government announced uh, earlier in uh, January, actually, um, that uh, they were going to they were proposing significant changes to the safeguard mechanism, uh, environment, um, sorry, climate change minister Chris Bowen, uh, I think he might have even been standing in front of a Rio Tinto refinery in Gladstone when he made the announcement, but the, this, uh, the safeguard mechanism is a part of that kind of federal policy framework that's intended to manage and reduce carbon emissions um, from our biggest climate polluters. It sits alongside things like the emissions reduction funds uh, that buys carbon credits and um, encourages uh, projects to be developed that remove or cut carbon. Uh, so uh, carbon credits, as you would be aware, can be purchased by um, 
by various um, facilities across Australia and, and here those uh, captured um, under the mechanism can purchase the credits to help reduce um, their, their emissions reduction obligations. Uh, the mechanism applies to any facilities that produce the equivalent of 100,000 tonnes of CO2 a year, some exceptions to that, um, trade exposed industries, power stations. And all in all, there's about 200 uh, facilities, industrial facilities across Australia that this applies to, that produce 100,000 tonnes or more um, each year. Uh, and, and so these proposed changes are requiring these big emitters to reduce their carbon emissions by about 5% a year each year until 2030. Uh, and, and the whole purpose of this overhaul um, is helping the government achieve its target of the 43% cut in emissions by 2030 uh, and achieving net zero by 2050. Uh, so under this plan, uh, the emitters um, don't face any limits on the use of carbon offsets, so they can purchase as many carbon offsets as they want, as are available. Uh, the idea behind the government doing that is to encourage businesses to move to cleaner practices rather than reducing production in Australia. But as you can imagine, there's been a fair bit of critical comment on that. So they can buy Australian, Australian carbon credits. There's also new safeguard credits announced. Uh, so for any of these big polluters that are below their individual set limit, they can sell uh, their gap effectively to those that still over emit. Um, this, this is the bit that's going to be interesting because uh, even as recently as in the press this morning, the coalition is hinting at not supporting this approach, which means um, that the government will have to do a deal with the Greens. The Greens might push back on buying offsets. And so while they are hopeful that all this will be enacted by 1st of July this year, there's still a bit of uh, political manoeuvring going on. But like all of the developments, both nationally and globally, this is really a good proxy for what's likely to happen going forward, right? So we're starting with Australia's biggest emitters. We're turning the screws on them in terms of their emissions reduction requirements. Uh, so there's not expectations, there's requirements. Uh, and you can imagine that this will only get, um, I suppose, more widespread across not just Australia's biggest polluters, but also um, other businesses down the chain as well. So we expect, once this is actually passed and we know what the final format looks like, we expect this to be the start of uh, probably a, a, an increasing um, regulatory approach, which takes first these big polluters and then moves further down the chain to start to include other people in the in the decarbonisation requirements. Absolutely. So thank you very much, um, Ashley. So as you can see, most of this have actually happened in December, January, where I, when I was really enjoying a wonderful holiday. So a little bit of a recap on everything that's happened. Back to our, I would say, original webinar topic um, around the United, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, now, this is an, a nice image that put all the goals together, 17 goals. Um, now, personally, I love these goals. Um, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, nothing can eat me down, and I just like the uh, optimistic nature of these goals. Let's achieve, try and achieve something. Let's aim for something. And so they've put 17 goals together um, around no poverty, zero hunger, uh, number three, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, and a number eight, decent work and economic growth. I'm just thinking who wouldn't aspire to achieve these goals? Um, industry, innovation and infrastructure, um, reduced inequalities, uh, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption in production, I think for the young people in my house, that is an important one because I think they buy too much stuff. Um, but, um, you know, and then climate action number 13, number 14, life below water, live on land, and 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, um, and 17 partnerships for the goals. So, high level goals, 17 high level goals, um, think mainly for governments to try and achieve and say if all of our governments and all of our different countries work together and we try and achieve these goals the world would be a better place absolutely agree with that so it's high level goals so it's a universal call to action 
to end poverty, to protect the planet, and to improve the lives and prospects for everyone, everywhere. Um, so high-level goal um, put out by the United Nations. Um, so this has been adopted by um, the UN member states in 2015, um, and they've tried to establish um, as a interlinked, meaningful, and an aspirational focus areas for global sustainability. Um, they, they signed up to this in 2015, and the idea that this has to be actionable by 2030. Um, they've got 17 goals, and these goals are supported by 169 uh, combined targets. And on the right-hand side is one of the images that we found that try and put it together to look at some of this is around economy, some of this is around society, um, some of this is around the biosphere and, and, and the planet. So just a different way to put it together. So really an important first step for governments and UN members to say, this is what we want to aim to achieve um, and really important goals. Um, Ashley, I couldn't remember that you want to put this in perspective. <laughs> Did I start to do your section again, as I always do? No, 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 not at all. No, I think um, I think you were going to talk through this section, but I can. Uh, um, I, I mean, I think we there's 17 of them. I don't think we necessarily want to spend a huge yeah. amount of time going through each of them individually. What we want to talk about is how they're applied in practice by the business community, including the Australian business community. Um, but did, did you want to single any of these out and talk to some of these in detail? Yeah, no, that's good. So I think what we've dropped, what we thought, and, and, and there's a lot of material, if you look at the United Nations website, and you search for these goals, there's a lot of materials and a lot of images um, that they make available for us to use. And you can see some of it here on number one, no poverty. I think the point that Ashley and I wanted to make, these goals are amazing. These are goals for governments and for broader society to try and achieve. Um, they also, in their publications, try and make it more um, realistic for organisations and even more realistic for individuals. So what can an organisation do to support no poverty? What can individuals do to support no poverty? So for example here, very high level goal, we want to eradicate all poverty for all people everywhere by 2030. An amazing goal for all governments to have, for all of us to have. Um, and then they said, how will we measure it? We'll measure it as people living on less than $1.25 per day. Um, you know, that's how we want to measure it. Um, and then they said, okay, let's make it a bit real. And this is the part I like. Organizations, how can you contribute to this goal? Because no one organization can fix it, but together, how can we contribute and help all governments? So social inclusion policies, unconscious bias training, paying living wages, right? So paying appropriate wages for our staff, um, employment conditions, really important, support community initiatives and disaster relief efforts. And we've had so many disasters in Australia with fires, with floods, but to support those, whether it's financial or through volunteer hours. Um, so you can see this is now organisations at your level, what can you do? And obviously individuals, what individuals can do. So no poverty. So give you another example around number two, zero hunger. We want a world free from hunger, such a basic thing, we need food. Um, how can organisations contribute sustainable sourcing decisions, food waste management, um, donation programs locally and globally. Um, so again, high level goal, organizations, how can you participate? And this is not just how can you participate if you're in the food industry or the retail industry, it's not just for the Coles and the Woolworths, it's for all of us, how do we manage um, food waste? How do we donate? Um, how do we see a need and contribute? Um, you can see good health and well-being. Uh, we know we've got employee assistance programs at most organizations with COVID. How do we look after our people? 
um, that people that our employees can access get access to pay time off to address um, mental and, 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 and physical health and well-being. Um, quality education, again, what do organizations do to support ongoing professional development or ongoing learning of people to improve them to get better jobs? Um, you know, employment programs for school leavers, university placements, uh, graduate programs. So I'm extremely passionate about quality education coming from an academic background. Um, you know, absolutely love education and fantastic to support that. Gender equality, um, such a big thing to give a, every girl uh, an equal opportunity. So I'm for, I love the words gender equality. I don't want to promote females above males or the other way around. It's equal opportunities. Um, for me, that's really important. And it's around parental leave for males and females, a flexible working for males and females, um, et cetera. Uh, clean water and sanitation. Now in Australia, we don't really appreciate this. Um, coming from South Africa, um, you know, I appreciate that not everybody in South Africa today have access to clean water and sanitation. And I can see it. And you can feel it so you know this is close to my heart um so it's education and awareness of these issues participate in world water day a uh, water security initiative initiatives um etc um again affordable and clean energy this is something we we know and we talk about in australia part of our renewable energy and we know you know we read about what the government is doing about renewable uh, energy. So I think, again, organisations, how can you contribute uh, through energy efficient fuels, appliances, etc., technologies, um, around decent work and economic growth, so important to protect labour rights and the legislation we have around modern slavery, employment and training for underrepresented groups, the youth, women, migrants, I'm an immigrant, so let's give work to migrants. Um, I, I have to say I was a privileged immigrant. I came with a great education, but there's a lot of people who don't arrive with those privileges in Australia. And how do we support them? Um, you know, stable employment opportunities. These are very important stuff. Um, if we look at industry innovation infrastructure, I know Ashley is very passionate about an innovation. Um, and how do we do things better? Um, more efficient, a better technology. Um, we look at reduced inequalities. So again, equal opportunity. We're not pushing anybody above another. It's equal opportunity in employment practices. Um, create, maintain a safe and inclusive working environment, really important. Engage with vulnerable communities. This is really important for us. In Australia, how do we engage uh, with um, vulnerable communities who've just arrived with refugees? Um, as I said earlier, you know, I arrived in Australia with a great education. I could speak English, and it's not easy to adjust in Australia if you're a migrant. Um, I've been. This is now my 21st year in Australia, but it was tough those first few years, and I came with all the privileges. Um, so I often wonder how people come. Um, you know, without education, maybe can't speak English, and without families, it's 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 tough. Uh, how do we support them? Um, and then also they have included some targets on how we can reduce these inequalities. Amazing targets um, that we could embrace as organisations. Sustainable cities and communities. You know, intelligent building and facility design. Uh, how do we make our cities uh, more inclusive? Um, you know, BDO are moving to new premises and we were thinking about how do we make it a better place to work, uh, planting trees and all those things, uh, urban development. Uh, another one around responsible consumption and production, supply management practices, um, um, you know, review our resource efficiency, assessing product, production alternatives, uh, better waste solutions, really important. Um, and again, climate change, now we've talked about that a lot, to at least measure our scope one and two or three emissions. We'll talk about that next month. 
And then based on that baseline, how do we set targets and what strategies do we put in place to reduce our footprint and to achieve those targets? Um, and again, some examples of targets, life below water, this is a bit harder for, for a video around, um, you know, how do we um, raise awareness around biodiversity, et cetera, um, life on land, um, ethically sourced and sustainable products, um, research and funding, um, for, um, you know, for certain diseases, um, and it's to preserve life below water and on land for future generations which is really important. Um, and then again, if we look at peace, justice, and strong institutions, you know, human rights commitments, inclusive culture and policies, supply chain and procurement policies, modern slavery statements. So you can see there's also a lot of overlap between the things we do and how it fits into the different goals that we could align to. And again, some targets, and then partnerships for goals. Um, you know, organizations can contribute to by identify how these SDGs uh, align with our purpose and values, um, an integration of these goals into our strategy, communication of these goals internally and externally. So one of the things um, Ashley and I have done at BDO is when we've started on the whole sustainability ESG journey, we realized that we need to educate not only um, external people to BDO, but we have to start internal with our own partners and staff. Um, so we had an awareness campaign where we promoted these goals, what they represent, what organizations can do, what individuals can do. I think we, we ran a number of initiatives to push these out throughout BDO. So really important for us to just raise that awareness. Actually, I think I'm gonna take a rest and I'll leave you to discuss some of the case studies where some organizations have done an amazing job um, aligning to these goals and um, communicating that externally. Okay, thanks, Aleta. And I think what's really cool about uh, some of these, or what's really cool about the 17 of them, if you take them in totality, is so much of what they talk about is not, um, not carbon related or not environment related. So seven and 13, uh, so affordable clean energy and climate action, obviously related to um, carbon. And and carbon gets a huge amount of airtime uh, in Australia and globally, and rightly so, because the planet is obviously warming and we need to reduce carbon emissions drastically to stop the planet more, warming more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So, um, it's, so it's right that it gets a high degree of exposure, but it's also really cool that a lot of this is about things other than climate change, which are all equally important ESG initiatives. And obviously carbon sits in the E bucket and it's one of the E themes, but there's plenty of S issues and plenty of G issues to also deal with in this space. And so, yeah, that's really important. I think that these, that these 17 SDGs cover the field in many respects. So how do companies apply them? Most companies don't look at them and go out and try and um, make an impact on all 17. What they typically do is they look at the 17 and they say, okay, where can we as an organisation have a significant impact? And how do these things relate to what we've identified as key priority issues? Now, a lot of those key priority issues come from some kind of materiality assessment. We talked about materiality assessments last year, which is asking stakeholders what they care about. There are different stakeholder groups different stakeholders care about different things with different levels of priority and so working out what's important to your overall stakeholder group and working out how those map back to um, different SDGs is how most businesses deal deal with these uh, this, mm. this frame. So a couple of examples um, let's start with Charter Hall so uh, this is uh, Charter Hall's sustainability framework they have nine focal points for what they're doing or sustainability pillars and what they do is they have the detailed their nine pillars but they map those nine pillars back to the SDGs so on the next slide um, a letter you'll see this is just a screenshot of three of them so the first one climate action they align climate action with seven nine and thirteen those three little boxes there that you might not be able to see that's affordable clean energy industry innovation infrastructure and climate action so their second 
um, focal point, uh, rethink resources. They say aligns with three, nine, eleven, and twelve. So good health and well-being, industry innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production. And then the third one they've got there, which is restore nature, uh, aligns with six, nine, eleven, and twelve. And I don't need to go through them again. But but the organisations typically identify focus points in their business and then explain how they map back to the SDG framework. Uh, Charter Hall uh, also goes one step further. They have a separate standalone document which talks about their SDGs. Interestingly, they have identified uh, all but four as relevant to their business. Now, 13 is a lot for most organisations. Most organisations might have four, seven, nine. 13 is a lot. Uh, Charter Hall obviously has an incredibly big footprint physically uh, across the country, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of things that that relate to their um, their business operations, but some other examples that might interest you. So Coles, uh, Coles and Woolies are doing great things in and around sustainability, heavily driven by consumer preferences. So what we want to buy in our supermarkets has a huge impact on what Coles and Woolies are doing in sustainability. You can see here, Coles has identified nine um, nine sustainability goals as a focus area for them, and then they've gone and taken all of their key priorities. Uh, or what they call their material issues, and they've mapped each of those material issues back to various SDGs. Now, these aren't mutually exclusive, right? So you can see that some of these pop up quite regularly. So you can see you can see that 12 is there quite a bit, uh, and a few of the other ones as well. And so what you'll often find is that the SDGs will affect more than one strategic sustainability priority within a business. Uh, I think Clean Away is the next one. So CleanAway's got five strategic pillars, people, earth, markets, assets, financials. They map each of the SDGs back to their pillars. So people, they've got decent work and economic growth. Again, they're probably too small to see. Uh, earth, um, not surprisingly, maps back to affordable energy, uh, climate action, responsible consumption, life on land, uh, so on and so forth. And so this is the kind of way that you'll see throughout these reports that each of these businesses are doing it. Uh, all the big banks, obviously, they do a huge amount of work around reporting in those spaces. This is just one example. So NAB uh, has three kind of strategic sustainability pillars with 10 identified priority focus areas under those three pillars. They've mapped collectively, they've mapped all those back to only six SDGs. So remember, Charter Hall had 13, NAB has six. It says this is where we think we can make the biggest impact, right? Affordable and clean energy, decent work, Industry and innovation, sustainable cities, climate action, obviously, uh, and life on land. So, so, so that's how NAB is approaching this. Uh, NAB also produces a scorecard, a lot of detail in here, but you can see there's an SDG column. So they explain in their scorecard how each of these specific initiatives that they're measuring maps back to the SDGs. Uh, and then uh, you've got Dexas is one here. So, so Dexas there separately identifies uh, its. Um, SDGs that are relevant to its business operations. It also maps those to, to Dexas's own um, sustainability focus areas, which is uh, what you can see under there. And then the writing that's probably too small to see uh, subsections within each of the within, within each of the goals that it specifically identified that it thinks it can have a significant impact on. So they're quite granular in how they in how they've done it. But they're just some of the examples um, for how companies approach that. Uh, and so question I suppose we're interested in is what's everyone else doing in this space? So uh, hopefully we can launch our first polling question for you now. Uh, Aletta, do you launch the polling question? Here we go. I, well, I try to actually. I'm not always successful, but I'm trying. <laughs> Excellent. So, so question for everyone. So what role do the SDGs play in your sustainability strategy? So your options are nothing. Uh, we've considered them and we've mapped them to our strategy. We've identified them as priority goals. We've reported against one or more of them, or we've aligned with a framework or standard other than the SDGs. So we'll give you uh, a minute or so to to share with us what you've been doing so far please remember that there's no judgment involved and it's anonymous so nobody would know 
Um, however, it's interesting to, to see what people are doing and to what extent they look at different frameworks, different goals, etc. So thank you very much for participating. Uh, we really appreciate that. Ashley, I, I like your overview of how different entities have used um, these goals. I found that really interesting. Thank you, Aleta. Do we get to see the results? We'll do that very soon. I'll, I'll give you a, a, a five second countdown. Three, two, one. And I think that is a close. And I'll share the results. Yeah, interesting. It is. It is. It's not um, unexpected that that quite a few of you aren't doing much around the goals. I think as we get closer to 2030, their expiration date. That's the wrong term. Um, we'll, we'll probably see people starting to focus on other frameworks to report under, or other standards to report under, which are likely to be more aligned to the ultimate regulation that comes our way at some point in the future. Absolutely. Um, but I think there's still quite a number of people who actually have looked at the goals, um, mm. who've mapped it, maybe aligned with it, or use another framework. And I mean, you can use any framework, so um, all good. Um, the next thing we want to look at is the World Economic Forum International Business Council, so the WEF IBC, the abbre abbreviation that we talk about. Now, this has been issued by uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, you know, and they came up with, you know, what are some common metrics and consistent reporting of sustainable value creation? Um, I suppose before we look at this, when I look at those United Nations goals, as much as I love them, really love it, and so, uh, so lovely to be part of something that's trying to achieve those goals, they do not stipulate reporting requirements. Yes, these are the goals, these are the targets, but they're not telling us what to report. Where the World Economic Forum International Business Council went is they said, let's group the 17 goals into four pillars and come up with a sustainability reporting framework. So they said, we have a pillar for principle of governance, a pillar for planet, pillar for people, and a pillar for prosperity. And then they've established 21 core metrics or core items to disclose, and they've then expanded those, and they have expanded metrics as well. Um, so what's important here is that some entities would just look at these disclosures and say, if I align to the UN goals, um, these are the types of things that I could disclose for these goals. It gives me an idea of what I could disclose to communicate to stakeholders. Some people would say we're just going to start with the core disclosures or the core metrics, and maybe next year we look at the expanded metrics. Maybe initially we just use it as a guide. Maybe in future we would say we've actually complied with it. So again, a phasing or a gradual scoping can happen around the World Economic Forum. So if you look at the core metrics and disclosures, if you look at prosperity, uh, here are some of the core metrics and disclosures. This is an extract. Um, they've also mapped it to the GRI. They've mapped it to US GAAP. They've mapped it, mapped it to international accounting standards. Um, so around employment and wealth generation, you can disclose the absolute number and the rate of, employ of employment, so the total number and rate of new employee hires. That's something you could disclose. Economic contribution direct economic value generated and distributed, so revenue, operating cost, employee wages, payments to providers of capital, etc. cetera. Um, financial investment um, contribution, your total capital expenditure. Um, innovation um, of better products and services, so your total R&D expense will meet that requirement. Community community and social um, vitality, the total tax that you pay. So these are the core metrics around prosperity. And if you look at expanded metrics, like if you wanna go a step further, uh, for each you know, employment and wealth generation, there's additional things that you could report on. So for example, you can see innovation of better products and services, 
your social value generated, your vitality index, etc. So there's a core set and there's an expanded set for each of the four pillars. However, and, I, and this is something that I should thank our BDO clients and markets team for the digital team. I asked them to, to visually represent how the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals line up with the principles of governance. Oh, sorry, line up with the World Economic Forum. So within principle of governance, there are three goals. Within planet, six goals. Within people, six goals. Within prosperity, four goals. So now you can see, depending on the goals you picked, which pillars of disclosures you could focus on. Um, so just a different way to look at it. So people, um, you know, for BDO people is incredibly important. So no poverty, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, decent work and economic growth, reduced inequalities. Absolutely, those are our goals. And when we look at the disclosure, it would be all the disclosures around people in the World Economic Forum. That would be our number one priority. Um, the other thing, um, if we maybe try and put it in perspective, so what we've tried to do here is say, yes, there's a lot of goals, but as a corporation, if you want to make meaningful disclosures, how do you marry up the disclosures in the World Economic Forum to the goals? Um, so that's really just what we're trying to achieve here. Um, case study again for you, Ashley. Okay, uh, and I'll, I'll be very quick. I'm just conscious of time. So um, we looked uh, long and hard for case studies that would really represent uh, implementation of the four pillars of the World Economic Forum. Well, lo and behold, it turns out the BDO Sustainability Report is an excellent example of how to do this. Uh, obviously, <laughs> we're a little biased, uh, but Letta and I are very proud uh, of the Inaugural Sustainability Report released last year. Uh, and this is the executive summary from our report. But you can see that we've set it up in a way that reflects the four pillars of the World Economic Forum framework. And we've tried to highlight some of our, our key metrics in each of this, but you can see this in more detail. I suppose what is interesting is from a mapping perspective, what we also did was put in at the end of the report, how we map back to the core metrics in each of those four pillars. And so here you've got the four pillars and you've got the core metrics and we've detailed in our report where we address each of those metrics and if we haven't um, we've obviously identified that we haven't addressed it and that's something that we'll look to do in the future so the other thing we've also done as part of this process is we'll also created a, a checklist um, which is really easy to use it's not um, fancy in any respect but it helps you navigate through the process and identify where you can try and start to measure some of these things and report on them that's in one of the handouts which you should be able to download uh, and have a look at if this framework is of interest to you so another polling question very quickly, uh, similar to what we asked about the SDGs, we're very keen to know if people are using the World Economic Forum framework as well. So same question. So what role does the framework play in your sustainability strategy? So does it have no role? Um, have you considered it and aligned it to your strategy? Have you reported against this framework? Uh, have you reported against the expanded metrics in the framework? Or are you aligned um, with a framework or standard other than the WEF IBC framework? Again, we'll just give you a minute or two to think about this one. Um, actually, this will be interesting to contrast and compare to our previous uh, polling yeah. question. So thank you very much again, everybody, for participating. I should say again, remember um, in two weeks' time, we'll be looking at uh, carbon footprint. How do we calculate your scope one, scope two, scope three emissions? The importance of that carbon footprint and the role it's got to play, very important given the latest development in Australia. Um, I'll give you another five seconds to let us know about the World Economic Forum and I'll close this poll. Fantastic, I think. So if we close that one and if I share the findings. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there's a greater proportion that have chosen not to look at this framework, uh, but 
um, interesting. Yeah, I would have thought it would be quite similar to the Sustainable Development Goal, but it's interesting that it's a little bit different. Absolutely, because it's aligned. But you know, actually, when I was looking at the voting, the one thing I was thinking about, you know, the goals high-level goals that so many organisations aspire to, that's one thing, but then everybody can pick different frameworks to do their actual reporting on. Uh, and maybe yeah. that's the reason, yes, we all aspire to these goals, easy to understand, but we decide to report using different frameworks, so fascinating. Thank you very much. That was really interesting information. Um, maybe just a, a, a last recap on some ongoing developments, Ashley. Yeah, very quickly, uh, if you're interested, there's more information on both this. I, the World Economic Forum has a lot of great um, information articles. I follow them on LinkedIn because they produce really cool videos that are like one minute long videos. Uh, and I have the attention span of an ant, so um, one minute videos are perfect for me and it shows all the cool technology around the world that's kind of being developed, which I love. Uh, and then the UN regularly publishes information on its SDGs as well, if you're interested in following those in more detail. Yes, and uh, you know, if you look at United Nations website, they've got um, you know videos on how they try and how different organisations and different countries try and support those goals. And we usually share that within BDO as well. It's so interesting to try and encourage people with so they can see what others are doing. And um, the other thing we want to flag is that we um, have coming soon under development and nearly finished two new sustainability tools that we'll be making available um, free of charge on our website. The one is the sustainability readiness tool, given everything that's happening, how ready are you for the process? And then also an energy transition diagnostic tool. Again, we know the energy transition is coming. Um, so two tools that we'll be launching very soon. Finally, if you need any assistance, um, we've got our monthly corporate reporting insights that you could register for. Um, you can ref register for Corporate Reporting Insights where you'll get accounting and sustainability information or you could say, don't give me the accounting stuff, I just want sustainability information. Um, so you can register for that separately at the bottom. Um, you can visit our website if you want additional information around all things sustainability, including sustainability reporting. If you want to look at what we do around sustainability at BDO, our own firm, our sustainability report, um, you can access it on our website. And if you're looking at ongoing learning, obviously we've got the monthly webinars and we also have e-learning. E-learning on the a Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFDs, which are currently recommended in Australia, which will be replaced by the IFRS S2. So it's not wasted learning, um, you're just ahead of the curve. Um, and obviously, if you want to talk about any of this, please feel free to reach out to Ashley um, or I. But also, I would like to promote our broad and national ESG and sustainability team. Um, so a number of people in Victoria, in WA, um, key contact there, Catherine, in South Australia, Josh Carver, in Queensland, Brett Spicer, and in New South Wales, um, Justin Harness, Alex Amara. So please reach out to us. We would love to speak to you and see how we can help you on this journey. It's a continuous improvement journey. Thank you very much, Ashley and everybody for attending the webinar today. We really look forward to the next webinar where we look at carbon footprints, carbon one, two and three emissions. I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks, Leda. Bye.